The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you, Justice Apple. May it please the court, counsel. This case comes before you on grant of a motion for summary judgment by the district court below. The uh, Apple Munger firm represented the appellant's plants in a personal injury case that was resolved as a result of mediation. The Munger firm then, under a 33% contingent fee contract, charged a fee against the of the plants in the amount of $2,560,000, which was the full amount due under a 33% calculation of the recovery. The plants disputed the fee. The Munger firm sued the plants for breach of contract, breach of the fee contract. During the course of the proceedings of the lawsuit, the Munger firm filed a motion for summary judgment, contending that under Rule 32.1.5a of the Iowa Rules of Professional Conduct, the charged fee was reasonable. <clears throat> the Munger firm further urged the district court in making its reasonableness evaluation of the charged fee to consider only circumstances existing at the time the contract was entered into. Plants resisted the summary judgment motion. They contended that the fee, charge fee was unreasonable under 32.1.5 and urged the district court to consider in its reasonableness evaluation not only circumstances existing at the time the contract was entered into, but also all circumstances that developed thereafter during the operation of the contract through the conclusion of the provision of legal services. So would that mean that if things did not turn out as, as rosy as anticipated, could the lawyer perhaps go after the client and say, I know I said a one-third, things didn't turn out so great. I think you should pay me a little more. Well, Does it work both ways? In this case, it would, because the Munger contract also provided that if a notice of appeal was filed, then the percentage would go up to 40%. If the case was retried, the percentage would go up to 45 percent. Which well, that's not the question. The question is, well, if uh, if it turned out that uh, they put in lots of time and effort, um, uh, the far exceeded kind of an ordinarily uh, hourly rate. Um, uh, the contingency fee proved to be uneconomical. Could the, could the uh, law lawyer then say, well? This didn't turn out the way we expected. We want to renegotiate the contract. I think that was the thrust of the question. I take it the answer to that is no. The answer to that is no. And I'm not expert on this, but I believe that I have read, in fact, I know this rule exists because that if it, if it, if it does get to a case where an attorney is unable you know, financially to withstand what is occurring as far as expenses and so forth in a case, they can ask the court to withdraw. But like I say, I'm not an expert on that rule and how that, how that develops. At but my answer to the question is no. That doesn't and, seem fair, does it? I'm sorry? That doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, I, don't, I think that the, the idea of contingent fees, as I understand it, let me, just let me get to quantum Merowith then. 
Uh, okay, quantum merit to me is something that we, we use as a tool when the parties have not stipulated as to what should be charged. And to me, it kind of seems like your client wants um, that to be used as kind of as if she signed up for an hourly rate. No. That is, I, I will say that the, um, the Munger firm brief and the amicus curiae brief would lead, and I, I realize this more after reading the briefs after I'd filed my briefs, but, and um, with some consultation with someone else I was working, you know, working with on my argument. But I realized that um, they are at times saying that, that all we're advocating is just a dollars to hours conversion, or a, a hours converted to dollars, and that is not how I, that is not what a quantum merit analysis involves. I think a fair translation of the Latin quantum merit is as much as has been earned. And when I, when doesn't I doesn't that to, kind of sound like hourly? No, it doesn't. And there is, um, Justice uh, Cardozo said, old law is good law not to be taken lightly is the verdict of quiescent ears, I think in corn exchange. But I did find a an Iowa quantum Merowick case, 1933, Kelly, Shuttleworth, and McManus. Now there's some historical names in the Iowa bar versus Central National Bank, 248 Northwest 9, Iowa, 1933. And in that case, Kelly Shuttleworth didn't have something that would stand up uh, well enough to be a contract, but they bingo. Did. That's where I think our difference is. I want to back up work. a bit. I, I want to back up before you go to that argument. I want to back up. At what point did your client say, "Hey, I don't like the agreement that I entered into"? Was it after mediation? Yes. And so, wasn't mediation one year after the accident? Mediation was seventeen months after the accident. Okay, year and a half. Okay. And the, the mediation was on May eight, and the. Um, the uh, first memorialized complaint about the fee was on May 17, which was at a meeting, which is documented in of our Of 18, fact. correct? What? Of 2018. Of 18, after the mediation, you're right, nine days later. And um, then again in an email, May 31, um, between, from Roseanne Plant to Stan Munger. So yes, that is all. That is correct. I want yeah. to say one more thing, and then you can go to that talk. Do you think if I walked into a room of, uh, whether it be attorneys who are representing the city of Sioux City, and, and in my former life I was a former prosecutor and a former family law lawyer, and if this case came to me and I took it, and nobody knows me for doing any kind of PI work, if I walked into the room, do you think I would have been as successful as perhaps somebody who I think, as in this case, was known for maybe doing that kind of work. No, My point you, is, don't you think the presence of, of an attorney who specializes in that area might have helped resolve and get to that point where there was a payout? Of course it did. You, you versus you up there, not knowing nobody knowing you versus Stan Munger up in Sioux City. Yes, of course. The plants don't contest that this is our hours times rate equals the fee that you get under quantum merit, they recognize that there's value to the contingent fee system. It promotes the access to judgment, that's correct. That the reputation, skill, and experience of a lawyer adds value to the client's case. I lied, I have another question that's relative to that. Didn't your client, um, your, your client, Mrs., um, I can't remember her last name, Plant, Mrs. Plant, didn't she have a choice by Mr. Munger? He gave her three choices. Would you like to enter into an hourly rate, a uh, 25 or 33% and you advance the expenses or 35% and I'll advance the expenses and she who I think from the record is an attorney chose the one-third contingency uh, I I know that was stated and I have no reason to question it I did not check back to see my my thought was that it was the 12% interest rate that was uh, didn't want to pay on that but but that be as it may uh, let's just assume that that's correct. You know, I have no reason Thank to you. doubt what they said in their brief on that point. Now, if if, if we presume that the um, 
fee agreement here, the percentage is fair, or at least it's standard, it's customary. Why should we take a second look at it if your client had the ability to shop the case around, talk to different lawyers, negotiate uh, some sort of lesser contingent fee? Right? I mean, they've already bargained for and allocated the risk of loss and success. If she thought this was a great case or he thought it was a great case, they could have went to a different law firm and said, we'd like you to do this for 20%. So why should we disturb all of that bargaining that's been done? Maybe there are, I'm sure there are cases where that would be much more the case than in this one. And I think that's a factor that be, could be considered when you're evaluating all the circumstances during the operation of the contract. That was not the, that was not the case here. On November 16, the accident occurred. Chad Plant was in a coma on December 8 when Roseanne Plant went in and had her meeting with the Munger Law Firm attorney who handled the case. Her concern at the time was whether Chad was going to live or die, and if he lived, what was going to be the extent of her permanent disabilities, because she knew he was going to have permanent disabilities if he did live. So I'm sure there are cases where that is a heavier factor to weigh in, and it should, could be something that should be weighed. But um, this is not that case. So um, now, well, as far as... Let, let me ask this. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I looked at a number of the cases in, in Iowa and, and other jurisdictions, and, mm -hmm. and um, I found some cases uh, that focused on circumstances at the time of the execution of the contract where uh, courts found that the attorney actually didn't contribute much at all. Um, I think I saw one case where there was already a settlement in hand, and they ended up uh, resolving the case for about the same settlement that the client had when they walked in the door. Um, it made no sense for the attorney to take a third of, of that. Um, and the Hoffman case is like that. It is very much like that. Um, this case strikes me as not like that at all. Um, uh, the uh, resolution ultimately comes 18 months after filing. Uh, there's a, a fair amount of uh, maneuvering going on. There's of what? Maneuvering going on. I mean, they're preparing a day in the life video that uh, plaintiffs, skilled plaintiffs' lawyers uh, uh, put together. They're assembling their case. Ultimately, it goes to mediation. But this, this strikes me as a uh, well away from uh, the cases that say, well, ab initio didn't make any sense. It's, uh, it's well away from Hoffman. And so is the recovery and the amount of the fee well away from Hoffman. What we're saying here is, and this, and I know that you want to know, when am I going to contend to the district court? But this is really for what I'm really worried about today, and our issue today, is did the district court employ the correct standard when it evaluated reasonableness here? Do you look at just the circumstances when the contract's made? Or should you have to consider all the other circumstances? That's what I'm here for today. And you have to, I mean, look at, you can, you, I can make my argument if you want me to as to why uh, the value, the hourly rate of the Munger Law Firm on their rates, $310 an hour for a lawyer, $155 for a legal assistant, the value of their time spent in this case was $67,000. And only $38,000 of, of that was spent prior to mediation. And a large part of it was spent just doing the mundane details of this prepayment of expenses of $178,000, which we know the one-third fee was $60,000, which has been paid. So when you measure $67,000, if you want to do hours to dollars against the fee, that's $20,000 an hour. That's a lot. And I think that if we're going to, I think we have to think something about adopting the rule that we're going to do here is the reputation of the bar among, among the layman. Um, what do you consider to be a reasonable contingent fee in this matter? Is it the one-sixth that your client offered to settle for? 
The what? The, the one-sixth. One no, no. Roseanne Plant offered before you know, there was ever any lawsuit or anything. Um, and I think it was, bef it was before the, it was in, I think it was in May of 18, offered one point, to just pay $1.25 million. Which would be one-sixth, right? No, that's one-half of the fee they're charging. Which would be one-sixth. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I, I need to, I need what, to what, uh, brush up on my math. Sorry. What, what difference is Your view that that's a, let me just get finished. Is it your view that's a, that would be a reasonable fee in this matter? My own personal opinion? Well, uh, your view uh, as the representative of the plants in the, li in the litigation because you, you've said the existing fee is unreasonable. I'd like to explore what you think a reasonable one would be. Having read the cases, myself, my opinion is that that is too high. That's my opinion. But that's above my pay grade. That's for the district court judge to decide. You may wrap up. Please uh, wrap up your argument, please. Oh, oh, you're, you're, I'm sorry. You're over time, but, but conclude. No, I have, I, I uh, have nothing more to say at this time. Even if I had more time, I'd be fine just wrapping it up. Thank you. Mr. Den. May it, <clears throat> excuse me. May it please the court, uh, counsel. Again, Mos Ms. Uh, Roseanne Plant, one of the appellants in this case, is a lawyer who called upon Mr. Munger on November 16th, 2016, to ask him if he would represent her and her husband, Chad, the day after the city bus crashed into his car, almost killing him. So when she hired Mr. Munger, the one thing that she hired him to do was to get a great result for her and her husband to compensate them for this tragedy that they had just suffered. And he delivered exactly what they hired him to do. He got a great result. Under Iowa law, there's just simply no precedent which supports what they are asking this court to do, to overturn a standard 33 and one-third percent contingency fee contract, which this court in McCullough has already uh, declared to be uh, reasonable, uh, signed by the parties as required by Iowa Rule of Professional Responsibility, 32.1.5c. Uh, and the lawyer's uh, work on the case led up to the settlement. Contingency fee contracts are contracts for payment based upon results from settlements or verdicts, not based upon a set number of hours. They had, as was pointed out already, they had different options, including the contract uh, to pay based upon hourly fees, and they declined to do so. So buyer's remorse just doesn't uh, give reason to set aside a contingency fee agreement. Again, we're here on a, a decision granting summary judgment in Judge Wittenberg at the district court. Can I ask yeah. you to clarify your position a little bit? Sure. It, I take it it's not your position that contingency fee agreements cannot, are not subject to the rule and right. can never be reviewed. So. Ab absolutely. McCull uh, McCullough uh, and Hoffman, we're not asking the, the court to overturn McCullough and Hoffman. We, we think that uh, the language of those uh, uh, decisions applies, for, even though it was under the old DR2, uh, uh, DR206, and we're under the uh, different rule scheme now. Um, we're just simply asking the court to enforce what those cases said, is that uh, you don't retroactively look at, um, after a successful litigation, on a fee based upon a f uh, factors not applicable uh, to contingency fees. So... As I read McCullough, at least it says that the rules do not require a contingency fee agreement to be reopened. It doesn't say that it can't be. And I guess I want you to mm -hmm. clarify that a little bit. And maybe your position is just simply 33 and a third is reasonable as a matter of law because that is close to standard in the industry. That's uh, essentially our position. We, uh, I think if you look at places like the Iowa Practice Series article, which we cite in our brief, uh, the restatement of law governing lawyers and the Hoffman case, what they talk about, they, they do talk about um, looking at fee contracts that were signed when there really was no risk 
um, or there was some sort of a fraud or some kind of other thing put upon the client, which that just simply isn't the case here. Uh, as I'll get into, I think risk really does seem to be the defining uh, factor uh, going into the contingency fee contract. Hoffman, uh, what happened there, there was no risk because the insurance carrier had already decided to pay. Um, and then the Iowa Supreme uh, the Court uh, did look back at in it. In terms of risk here, at the time the agreement was entered into, there was the investigation that had already determined that, the, as I recall, that Mr. Plant was not at fault and that it was the fault was going to lie with the city bus driver. And then you knew you had a solvent defendant in the city. Mm -hmm. So... Where, you know, where's the, where's the, the, risk. the significant risk here? The risk is Trooper Olson's report, which Ms. Ms. Plant was there listening to uh, before she signed the fee agreement, was that this was a preliminary report. Uh, it was not approved by uh, the Iowa State Patrol Office in Des Moines yet. It obviously hadn't been uh, cross-examined yet uh, uh, by defense counsel. Uh, in the report itself, it talks about uh, a preliminary uh, estimates of his speed, which were over uh, the speed limit. So right then and there, they could get, have gotten a comparative fault instruction. Uh, there was, a, in the report, it also talks about he had four seconds, according to the trooper's estimate, to see the bus um, turning into him. And he only uh, reacted it with about 0.5 or 0.6, I believe. Um, uh, so there was, there's another comparative fault. Of course, the court knows you have a duty to try and once you know the other uh, person in a traffic case is going to uh, uh, not follow the law, you have a duty to try and avoid that. So just based on the trooper's report alone, there is a risk. What we know on top of that was that the city was hiring their own uh, accident reconstruction expert. They never conceded liability. Again, uh, it's been misstated in the record what they did at mediation a year and a half later. They stated that uh, they were conceding liability only for purposes of the mediation. So you go forward with filing a lawsuit in this case, who knows what's going to happen. Everything is, a, is at stake here. Uh, comparative fault, you know, and we, at 51%, everybody walks away with zero. Uh, so there's just, there was, that was the time based upon uh, the facts of the case aligning, based upon Mr. Munger's experience, 40 years in this field. Uh, that that was the time to settle this case for the maximum result for the client, and that's exactly what happened then. Is my uh, review of the, are the, my, correct regarding the facts? Um, incident happened on November 15. Next day, wife went and talked to Munger, and he agreed to take the case, but the contract was not signed um, until December 8th. Correct. That was so it wasn't signed. The contract wasn't signed the day after the accident. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah, that was the uh, uh, kind of the first opportunity that Mr. Plant uh, was somewhat out of the woods at that point in terms of, of survival at that point, uh, knew that they were meeting with Trooper Olson. So that was when Mr. Munger gave those three options then, which uh, you mentioned already, Justice uh, Christensen, about uh, which uh, Ms. Ms. Plant declined on, on behalf of her and her husband. Uh, of it, course, it, if, if there were a fact issue here, <clears throat> and we're looking at this a reasonable rate according to the rules, whatever that standard would mean. Since this is a breach of contract action, would that then be a jury question? And you would try, essentially, the, state, the rules of professional conduct in front of a jury and have experts come in and assess the litigation risk, et cetera. And I only ask because this is not a case where a district court is awarding a fee pursuant to a statute or a contract. It's a breach of contract action, and the damages are the fee. We presented this case as, as a breach of contract action, as you mentioned. Uh, I don't think there was a, a jury request uh, in the petition or the answer. But uh, if you know, our position was there was no genuine issue of material fact, so that's why we filed summary judgment. Um, again, uh, Mr. Johnson, the position of, of the plants is that uh, there should be some sort of a, a reasonableness hearing even in the absence of a genuine issue of material fact, and we just don't think that there's any justification for that under the rules or under the law at this point. If it if there were an issue of fact, I mean, there has to be some fact finder. I mean, you guys be, can elect to have a bench trial, but it could be a jury issue. Then it would be it? tried. Okay. 
If we reverse this summary judgment, are we going to undermine the utility of contingent fee agreements by creating uncertainty if, you know, you got a one-third standard deal and then a quick settlement and then the client says, well, that fee's unreasonable, it's too high. Mm -hmm. Where does that leave us? It leaves the, uh, uh, the situation where uh, lawyers don't, uh, it's just great uncertainty. Lawyers don't know uh, going into a case uh, what the what the outcome is going to be? They're going to be much less likely to take cases. Access to justice is going to be an issue. The uh, Iowa Association for Justice uh, Amicus brief sets uh, that in great detail, which I won't repeat. But um, every every case could be subject to litigation uh, after a favorable settlement. The clients don't know what they're going to have to pay. Uh, the courts don't know um, unless there's the best place to determine what a reasonable uh, contingency fee is is at the time the, the, the contract is signed. Again, under circumstances like this where there is risk going forward, the, 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 the risk is balanced between the client and the lawyer. What essentially Mr. Johnson's argument is that all the, all the risk should be on the attorney um, going forward. What could happen uh, if you lose, uh, you know, if the, the attorney walks away with nothing, uh, the the attorney wins, um, the fee is going to be challenged. Uh, the attorney loses, he, uh, he could be sued for malpractice. I mean, you just there's any number of things that, that could happen to the lawyer, and, the, and that burden has just been shifted over to them. So I think it just would cause great, um, great uncertainty. Again, the contingency fee contracts have been in existence. First case I found in Iowa was from 1870, proving uh, uh, contingency fee cases. This is just the way... Uh, access to justice for clients who who can't afford to proceed in a case like this uh, is the way it happens and it's the way it has occurred and its system works so we're just asking the court not to not to affect that system um, just a few more I, I've already talked a little bit about Hoffman again that case just doesn't apply because uh, there was there was uh, uh, no, no risk. And if you look at the, the, the language of that opinion, it talks about, well, an a contract that was reasonable at the time it was signed can become unreasonable if uh, attending circumstances mean it's unreasonable. Well, attending circumstances relates to at the time it was signed. And what the, what the parties, of course, didn't know is that the insurance company had already found liability. So the, what, the, what the key language then is, that the lawyer's work led to, did not lead at all uh, to the recovery for the client, whereas as, as the, the, the observations here so far, uh, the lawyer's work after a year and a half did lead to the recovery. Um, the, the, again, as I mentioned, the, the, the change between the uh, disciplinary rule system and the new 3215, uh, the, the eight factors are the same. Uh, the, there's, there's just no basis for doing what they're asking the court to do is to change the analysis of McCullough and Hoffman and the way you look at these things. The only thing that changed was the clearly excessive versus reasonable versus unreasonable standard. But if, again, if you look at McCullough and Hoffman, when they decide what a, a clearly excessive fee is, what do they look at? They look at whether or not the fee was reasonable or not. You look at page um, 461 of the McCullough decision. We do not find the one-third contingency fee to be unreasonable. So what was a clearly excessive fee and unreasonable one? So there, the language has changed, but really the, the gravamen of those decisions has not. So um, again, in some, when uh, the plant hired Munger, there was risk. Um, Mr. Munger thought so, uh, as undisputed testimony. Uh, they thought there was going to be a fight. The plants thought there was risk because then they defined the hourly option. The jury could have avoided it, awarded them nothing. The plants got exactly the results they bargained for when they hired Mr. Munger. It got them the maximum result when the time was right for settlement. So we're under Iowa law. This reasonable fee agreement uh, leads to a reasonable fee. And so we're asking that Judge Wittenberg's uh, decision be upheld. Could you address the 1% issue, please? Uh, the 1%, again, that's, uh, if you look at the, I don't know if this is cited in the brief or not, and I don't have a cite for you, but it's the McKittrick case, M-C-K-I-T-T-R-I-C-K, -I -I -K, case from this court. Basically, the issue is um, uh, with, with an account receivable, as long as there's notice in writing to the client, um, that then it's, it's a, and it doesn't violate Iowa's usury statutes, 
then it's a, uh, a reasonable uh, interest rate. I believe in that case it was 1.5% per month. Here we have a 1% per month simple interest rate. So this, um, uh, the simple interest rate, of course, is, is uh, as opposed to compound, which is not appropriate under Iowa law, 1% uh, simple interest is. And I would just further note, there's been no preservation of error on that either. They really didn't raise that before the district court or often any evidence that that was unreasonable. Thank you. Do I have any other questions? Thank you very much. Rebuttal. Um, on that, Tyler uh, Shallowworth case, that, that was um, Quantum Merit, 248 Northwest 9 at 14, 14 and 15. Here's the five elements that the court in 1933 said you consider, you must consider in a Quantum Merit award, amount involved. That sounds familiar. Character of the question in the case, novelty and difficulty we have in Rule 32. Standing of the attorneys, reputation of the attorneys in 32. The time occupied, time and labor in Rule 32. The result accomplished, that's in Rule 32 also. And let's remember that when the Rule 32, when you uh, do your reasonableness evaluation to a contingent fee, factor eight says whether the fee is contingent or not. It makes a difference because everything that everybody says that's correct about the contingency fee system and how valuable it is and that uh, an attorney should be able to earn a very large fee sometimes in order because he's gonna lose some cases. Well, the, our, the evaluation of looking at all the circumstances in the operation of the contract doesn't prevent a very large fee going to a lawyer, but it needs to be reasonable and what it will protect is the client from those circumstances where a fee is really, under the, under the factors, is a, is a windfall to the attorney. Does it make a difference that the, the client in this case is, is an attorney? No. Why not? Because she is still a client. She was a matrimonial attorney. There's a, there's a, a relationship of trust and integrity between an attorney and a client. She has a right to rely on the attorney, and she testified that at the time that they entered the contract, she relied on what she was told by the attorney, by the plaintiff's attorney, as to what was going to occur. And she's, she's not, she was a client, not an attorney, and even if she was a personal injury attorney, she's still, she's still a client, and she deserves the, it, she still has a special relationship. So same case, if, if she were a, made a living as a, as a contingency fee personal injury attorney, same outcome in your view? Not as, not as same, no. But I still think if you look at the, if you would look, if you would then look at the rule, that you look at all the circumstances of the cases they developed, that would be definitely something that you would consider as um, having being a factor, but I also say that is not this case. And if it was this case, it might not have ever, you know, it might be treated differently. Can you um, address my concern about the uncertainty that would be generated on the enforceability of one-third contingency fee contracts if we reverse summary judgment here? Well, first of all, there are lots of different kinds of non-contingent fee contracts. There haven't been an avalanche of fee contest cases since 2005. And a, um, the, a lawyer, if they're gonna, if we're to have a lawsuit, a lawyer has to sign the pleadings and believe that there's a brutal basis in fact in law to do it, has to bring the case, and the evaluation of it, oh, the, um, the, the evaluation of a contingent fee is going to be different under Rule 32 than a non-contingent fee. Factor 8 says so. All these things that make it more reasonable for a lawyer to earn much in excess of his hourly rate of contingent fee are still there. But there can be important circumstances that develop 
during the course of the case that make a difference. If in a particular case, like maybe the one you're positing here, it's not going to make a difference or doesn't make any difference, it doesn't, the, the, it still is something that a district court should look at if they think it does make a difference. I, I took too long last time, so I have other stuff I could say. Thank you very much for your time. Very good. Uh, the case is submitted, and we're now ready to hear State of Iowa versus Davis.